All right, so uh, Ed, please start your presentation. Very good, thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna talk about one of the most important crises of uh, high economic inequality. You know, I'm an engineer and uh, we talk about things we can measure. So I'm gonna tell, show you how we measure economic inequality, uh, how it compares over different countries and how, it, how it's evolved over time in our country. We'll talk about the underlying reasons why it's happening. We'll talk about uh, how it's hurting our, our country and what we can do about it. And of course, there's always has to be a call to action. So let me get started here. We've had a whole bunch of crises re recently and brought to you by our friends on the right, the loyal opposition. And uh, they've kind of mastered the art of, of bringing up things to distract us from what's really going on. Wokeness is a major crisis. So wokeness, what does that mean? It means being aware that other people have um, injustice and, and caring about it. Well, uh, you know, I think we all need to be woke if that's what that means. Trans people, well, there's not many of them. And focusing on them is just kind of the way you start fascism, where you find some tiny minority and you say, these people are bad and let's do something about them. Critical race theory, come on. If there's actually residual racism in our country, we should know about it. We should, we should work to, to resolve it instead of ignoring it and saying, uh, this, is, this is damaging the country to admit this. Couch potatoes, do we really think that we have a lot of people who are, are claiming welfare and not working? Most people who are, are taking welfare are already working as much as they can and just can't put food on the table sufficiently for their, their families. Out of control government spending, oh, come on. Uh, our government spending is not out of control. Our government spending is exactly what our legislators have suggested it should be uh, to make investments in our population. And if it's out of control, it's, it's only because some people just don't want to spend that money. It's been going down. Our discretionary domestic spending has gone down with respect to our total national wealth. And if you want to talk about uh, the debt, well, a lot of it came during GOP administrations. These are manufactured crises. These aren't the real problems in our nation. These are things people are bringing up to try and distract us from the real problem. One of the most important problems is how high our level of economic inequality is. Uh, the five points I've just shown you came from Robert Reich, a guy I greatly respect, and I want to give him credit for stealing them from him. So I'm an engineer by background, and I believe we don't truly understand something unless we measure it, measure it numerically, not just have a feeling for it. So we measure economic inequality in the world through something called the Gini coefficient. There's an Italian guy named Gini who figured out a mathematical way of measuring inequality. And it's a measurement that goes from zero to 100, generally, is how it's expressed. Some people do zero to one. Zero to 100 is how it's most often expressed. Zero would mean everybody's got the same amount of money. And, and let me make it perfectly clear. Nobody expects it to be zero. Um, we understand that some people work harder. Some people work smarter. Some people are lucky. There's going to be inequality. It's, we're not all going to have the same. We shouldn't expect that. And we don't expect that. On the other hand, at the higher level, 100 would mean all the money's in one guy's hands. Well, certainly, you know, that, that doesn't happen. But think about that. Zero is everybody's got, got the same. Out of 100 is all the money's in one guy's hands. So let's look at how that number is distributed amongst countries. Here is a bunch of countries. At the top, you're going to find the Nordic countries, Nor Norway, Denmark, Finland, Sweden. Their numbers are around 26, 27. And then a little further down, you're going to see most of the rest of Europe and other modern Western countries like um, Canada. Their numbers are more like 33. Then you go further down, further higher, further to more inequality. Israel is about 38. Russia, communist Russia is 40. Communist China is 42. The United States is 44. We have more economic inequality than the communist countries. And we, we look at them and say they're corrupt. We're worse in terms of economic inequality. That's the truth of the measurement of inequality in our country. Let's look at that over time and see how that's evolved. If you look back around 1980, 
kind of small to see. That's 1980 there. We were down around 35. Back with 35 is back with most of Europe. So that's where we were in 1980. But it just went up in 90 and in 2000. And we've been way up there ever since, except for right now. Right now, it's coming down some. It came down some because of the pandemic. It came down some because we put money into people's hands to help them through the pandemic. And that's interesting. You see, there was a time in the past, in the, in the late 1800s, in what they would call the golden era, the robber baron era, the, the, the people who built the intercontinental uh, railways and all that, when it was very high. It came down during World War I and World War II. Turns out that wars and pandemics make us work together and make us share the wealth more. So when there's an emergency, when there's a catastrophe, it comes down. But we need to find a way to get it to come down without a war or without a catastrophe. So um, that's where we are. That's when it went up. And let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, this is something I want to I want to give credit to um, uh, Carl, uh, uh, Carl and David, who uh, helped me with this presentation. Carl mostly with helping me not say stupid things that aren't real, and David helping me find some uh, good numbers. And Carl always said, "You have to have numbers that you know where they came from." Ed and David said, "Oh, I'll help you get the numbers, Ed." So, so this is a graph that shows that our economy continues to grow. This top line number here is how the wealth of our nation has grown since uh, 1980. The bottom two lines, this, this red line down here is how compensation, worker compensation has grown in inflation adjusted numbers since 1980, which is to say not much at all. This middle line here is productivity because you see when, when your economy grows, it grows for two reasons. It grows one, because you got more people, more workers producing more stuff. Two, because they're more productive and each worker produces more stuff. So you can see that most of our growth has been because of increased productivity. Some of our growth is because of more people. So um, the economy has grown wages have compensation has not grown much since 1980 and the interesting thing about that is that if you look at how productivity has risen average workers uh, wages have not risen but the top one percent have risen tremendously and this is one of the graphs that a guy like carl would say oh, Back up. This is one of the graphs that Gar like Carl would say, you're not sure where this data is coming from, Ed. How can we believe that? And this is where, where David helped me. He said, okay, here's the real data, Ed. Here's the real data from the Federal Reserve. And you know what's really interesting here is back in the 50s and 60s, as productivity, the red line is productivity, as productivity rose, so did compensation. But starting around 1975 and going on, as productivity rose, compensation lagged dramatically. And um, it's interesting. This is back when unions were strong, when um, business shared rising profits from rising productivity with workers. And, and there's a lot of people have a lot of excuses for why this is happening, why business no longer is sharing rising profits from rising productivity. There's reasons like, well, automation means that um, you're getting your, your increased profits not from your workers, but from the investments you're making in automation. But you know, that was true back then. Back then you were making investments in, in, in the process uh, or offshoring or this and that. But the real answer is why did this gap start? This gap is really noticeable. These are some more of the, the numbers that David helped me find. In inflation-adjusted numbers, most people, most the, the bottom 20 
middle, the second, the third, the fourth are all going backwards. The top 20%, well, again, I'm doing this. The top 20% have come forward some. But if you look at the top 20%, even there, it's almost all in the top 1%, which goes, goes back to show that, that that graph is really true. Most of the benefit of the growth of our economy is going to only 1% of our people. Uh, this is another um, example of the same kind of thing. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office is showing that um, between 1979 and 2007 and 2019, the bottom 20% almost changed not at all. The middle 20% has actually gone down a little bit from this viewpoint. The, the upper middle class is doing a little better, but the top 1% is where all the gain is, all the gain. Uh, and we know that, as I said, if they had continued to grow compensation the way productivity grows, that's what this graph shows you. This is what compensation would be like for different groups if they had continued to grow compensation with productivity. In many of these cases, compensation would be almost double what it is now. Uh, not so much for the, for the upper group because they've already gained all that. But uh, look at this, the, the middle group here, that's, this group here is, is double what it would have been. This is maybe 40% more, 30% more. That's what um, if, if a, a typical full-time worker in 2018 earned 50 grand, he'd be earning almost 100 grand now, but he's really still earning about the same as he was then in inflation adjusted. Numbers. It doesn't have to be like this. I mean, other countries have proven that you can continue to share uh, rising profits with your workers. Compare, this is a, a, a very straightforward comparison. You look at and the, the way McDonald's reports their numbers in the U.S., this is really a little bit out of date because there's been a lot of states that have raised their minimum wage. But uh, if the, at the federal minimum wage, a lot of these people working at McDonald's are getting nine bucks an hour, no benefits, and the price of the Big Mac is five fifty. So look at Denmark. Denmark is a country that has a different idea of how they want to run their country. They want workers to succeed. They, the, the union, the workers in McDonald's are unionized. They get 22 bucks an hour. They get six weeks vacation. They get a year of paid family leave. They get life insurance. They get pensions. And the, the, the burger is even cheaper than here because the corporate profit is lower. And the way this happened, the way this happened is that the restaurant union, they're unionized through the same union that runs the restaurants. The restaurant union said, we're going to unionize the fast food places. And the fast food company said, no, we're not going to go for that. But they started picketing the fast food restaurants. And in Denmark, you don't cross the picket line. In Denmark, you respect workers. In Denmark, people stopped buying their products because there was a picket line out front. And they had to say, OK, you win. We understand in this country that workers get respect. So it can be done. What? changed. Why did we go from this to this? Aside from all the technical reasons of how they did it, the reason they did it was because in the early 70s, our chief economics people, including Milton Friedman, started teaching that the, the responsibility of business is to increase profits. You know, they're looking at a business, people invest in a business, people put their retirement savings in a business. They're saying the most important thing for us to do is to grow the value of our stock so these people who have invested in our business can have a comfortable retirement. I know that's, that's a reasonable argument. But you take it to an extreme. They took it to an extreme. They took an extreme to where their point of view was the only thing that matters is the stock price. And you should do everything you can to make the stock price as high as possible. Uh, you shouldn't worry about anything else. That's their viewpoint. The, the people who run the company have the responsibility to uh, conduct the, the, the business in accordance with the desires of the owner. And the owners are the shareholders. And the shareholders want a high stock price. So they, they started teaching. They started teaching this in MBA schools. 
and they started preaching this to corporate leadership and they all embraced it. They all said, yeah, you know, you're right. Making the stock price as high as possible is what we should be doing. And they used a diff- bunch of different ways to do it, but that's when this started. When this started to be teach, taught, when this was brought forth by Friedman and when it started being taught in uh, MBA programs. They concentrated on maximizing profits to maximize stock price, limiting worker salary growth. Uh, and in fact, they actually ended up increasing executive compensation. I'll show you why. And they started lobbying for government policies that helped them increase their profits and their stock prices, financial deregulation, tax cuts, trade policies. So we'll, we'll look through all of these areas. Limiting salary growth, well, the first thing they did was get rid of the unions, drive the unions bargaining power down. I mean, Reagan helped them with that when he helped break the air traffic control strike. Uh, Many states, red states mostly, passed right-to-work laws, which made it more difficult for unions to form and raise money. Uh, One of the ways you hurt salary growth is you just refuse to increase the minimum wage as inflation increases. So the minimum, the federal minimum wage hasn't changed in a long time, and uh, inflation has eaten away at it. The other thing you can do is you can find a way to eliminate things like overtime and and benefits through reclassification. You can uh, you can say, well, you know, you're a manager now instead of an hourly worker, uh, and that means you don't get overtime. You just have to work as much as you need to work to get your job done. Or you can reclassify people as an independent contractor instead of an employee, and then they don't get benefits. And you can move jobs offshore. And in fact, I will say that moving jobs offshore is how I got involved in this stuff, because I was involved in a software IPO where I helped build hundreds of good paying jobs in the US, Uh, software engineering jobs, sales jobs, administrative jobs. And um, at some point, the stock went up, the stock went down, Moved up, they made me move all the jobs to India. So we destroyed several hundred good paying jobs uh, in the US through offshoring. And that's when I decided something's wrong here. We gotta start figuring out why this can happen, why we promote this. So, and, and then along with lowering the, the, the compensation for all the workers, uh, they ended up allowing executive compensation to rise dramatically. Uh, through a number of means, changes in tax law, how they structure corporate executive uh, compensation, and the drive for uh, short-term stock price. So the change in tax law that was significant was the law 93, which said, you know, normally, normally when a business pays salaries, that's an expense to the business, and it can be deducted so that it lowers their gross income to a lower net income they got to pay taxes on. There was companies that were paying a lot of money to executives, and we passed a law in 93 that said, you can't pay your executives just as much as you want and deduct it all. If you pay your executives a lot, only the first million would be deductible. Anything over a million bucks would not be deductible, would would be part of your profit that you got to pay taxes on, except except if that amount over a million is performance-based. If, if you have some metric that you say there is the, the executive is responsible for hitting and he gets paid more than a million because he hits that, that objective. And the objective they chose always was the stock price. So this meant to companies, company executives, that if we tie our compensation to our stock price, Then we can get paid as much as we want, as long as we make the stock price go up the way we said we would. Kind of a a problem in terms of incentive, because what that caused was that caused businesses, it caused the executives in the business to focus entirely on the stock price. They did everything they could do to get the stock price as high as possible in this quarter to uh, make sure they could make as much money as they could. And sure enough, in the late 90s, stock prices went through the roof because the incentives were such that the executives were getting paid more if they made the stock price go up. So they did everything they could to make the stock price go up. That's the problem because that um, causes them to, to want to limit everybody else's pay. Uh, it causes them to focus only on the short term 
And that's a, a, focusing only on the short term is a real problem. And, and I'm going to give an example of why that can happen. The, one of the reasons that can happen is, you know, if there are risks, financial risks in your company, shareholders should know about it. Shareholders should, folk, should factor that in to the, the willingness to invest in the company. But this focus on short-term stock price means executives tend to want to hide risk. They, they don't want to, they don't want to manage risk. They want to hide it so that people aren't worried about risk and they continue to invest in the company and stock price goes up. And you'll, you'll see the results of that. Look at a place like uh, Silicon Valley Bank. They had a lot of risk. They didn't manage it well. They hid it. And eventually they went under. And, uh, and, and instead of people losing their money, we had to bail them out. But this causes you know, just executives to want to hide risk instead of managing it. So uh, financial deregulation had a large part of this as well, because it, it, it caused there to be a lot of businesses that were simply around to, to manage money. And all the executives that are managing money are able to tap, tap into that cash flow. We have way many more banks in this country than we really need. Uh, but there's a, there's a, a way that, that executives running financial institutions can siphon money off uh, and tax regulations are such that it makes them easy to do that. It's just another area where money is going into the hands of very few. Um, so all that combined, falling top tax rates, preferential tax treatment for stock options, deregulation of finance, failures in corporate and governance to manage risk properly, all that combined to, uh, to give um, a few people uh, a way to leverage their income over and above everybody else. And why were those changes made? I mean, those, those, those changes were, there were changes in law, changes in policy, changes in, um, in teaching, how we, how we teach MBAs. The, all this stuff happened, most of the stuff happened because people with money made it happen. They made it happen by hiring lobbyists. You know, back in 1970, there wasn't a lot of money spent on lobbying. But you know what happened in 19, in that time frame? Well, the Democrats, through Johnson, implemented some policies like Medicare that business didn't really like because it was raising taxes, cutting their profits. And when Nixon from the other party came in, business executives expected Nixon to try and roll back what Johnson had done, just the same way Trump tried to roll back what Obama had done. But Nixon didn't. Nixon made it worse. Nixon started the EPA, which had even more taxes and more regulation and more impact on business profit. And that's when business leaders decided they had to take matters into their own hands. They couldn't trust either party to do what was best for business. So uh, that's when these business leaders started spending a lot on lobbying. And lobbying has gone up and up and up and up, and they've gotten their money's worth because it's because of this lobbying that the government has done what enables all the stuff I just showed you. So what has this done to our country? It's caused us to be polarized. It's limited social mobility. It's caused unequal access. It's caused economic instability. It's undermined our democracy. The high levels of economic inequality, frankly, makes people unhappy. They see, they see how a few people have so much money, they can build a, 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 a yacht you can't even take out of the harbor because it's too big to go under the bridge. They see how a guy like Musk or Bezos can, can, can just throw money around and get his way with stuff. And, and they, they feel left behind. They feel left out. They know that they're not sharing in the growing wealth of our country the way these people are. I'm restraining myself. <laughs> um, and that leads to increased social and political polarization. It leads to unequal access to opportunities. I mean, we have, we're wasting human capital. We have plenty of people who, with a good education, with good health care, with better job prospects, could be contributing more to our economy, but they're not because they can't afford an education and we don't help them get it. They can't afford decent health care and we don't help them get it that uh, creates bigger and bigger gaps between rich and poor. It hinders our progress as a country. It causes economic instability. I mean, we have, we can produce more than people can buy. 
people don't have the income, the disposable income to buy the stuff we can produce. And, and you can see the impact it has on our economy from some of the um, crazy stuff that, that people with a lot of money try and do. And we've got people who recently decided they ought to uh, crash our economy so they can reduce taxes. There's big impacts on our economy from this stuff. And it really undermines our democracy because, well, the Supreme Court has decided that money is free speech. You can spend as much money as you want influencing politics. And that means that a few people have really big voices in our democracy over you and me. And that does undermine our democracy. Bottom line, this high level of economic equality damages our economy because folks can't afford to buy what we can produce. They can't afford education to make themselves productive or their children productive. They can't afford healthcare to keep them productive. Damages our society. People lose faith in their future. Uh, and that is one of the reasons that we have a lot of drug problems and a lot of suicide because people feel like they have no, no future. They give up. The other thing is that this drives people to, it makes them so upset, they, they insist there's got to be change. There's got to be change. And that enables populists. That enables people to come along and say, I can get the change you want, even though they can't. And they get people to, they get, there's, you know, a guy like Trump gets people to vote for him just because he says, I know how to fix this, when in fact, he doesn't. And in fact, he, he, he has no intention to fix it. He's just pandering to the rage in the population and, and they get control that way. That's what populism is all about. And high levels of economic inequality enable populism. So what do you do about this? Oh, by the way, we see the impacts all around us. So many things that are wrong in our country can be traced back to this, gun violence, hate crimes, culture wars, um, conservative control of state government, suppressing voters, limiting Medicaid expansion. Let me tell you something about limiting Medicaid expansion. There was a study recently that looked at bankruptcy rates in the, in the country. Most of the bankruptcies in the country are in the South. Most of them are in states that didn't expand Medicaid because of medical debt. Those states that won't take Federal money to expand Medicaid are causing financial hardship to their citizens. Uh, and that's just because a few people with a lot of money think that we shouldn't be doing it. Uh, it the limits on reproductive rights, deregulation of business, lack of safety in meat packing plants. Why do we have that? Because business wants lobbies for these rules that make it easier for them to make profit. Use of prisoners to, to do work, child labor in factories. We have some red states that are, that are making it easier for kids to work in factories. And a lot of them are undocumented immigrants. All this stuff is happening to us because a few people with a lot of money are pushing our government to do these things. You even see some state governments that just completely neglect some of their communities. Jackson, Mississippi, they the can't they can't get enough money to fix their water systems. Flint, Michigan had the same problems with their water systems. So what do we do about all this stuff? Oh, uh, by the way, it's not just in the South. Uh, Jim, Jim McGrath knows this really well. We had school board elections up here and I, I talked to people and I talk to a lot of people, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I do a lot of church singing. I talk to people, I talk to really blue people in church choirs, and I say, you know, we had people in, um, in Northwest suburbs trying to get on school boards so they could ban books. And, and people say to me, that's happening here in Illinois? Yes, that's happening here in Illinois. And there was a lot of money, a lot of money coming from out of state, some from in state, pushing this stuff. We couldn't meet Jim, Jim and his group could not meet their money, but they met them through action. They met them by knocking on doors, writing postcards, the writing letters, phone calls. And we were able to defend our school boards against all that money because we worked so hard. So that leads us to what we can do. We can work hard. The things we need, we need progressive taxation. We need a higher minimum wage. We need to strengthen workers' rights. We need to make sure the social safety nets are there. We need to make sure education is good. 
We need to make sure we have equality of opportunity. We know what progressive taxation is about. It's about asking those who can most afford to help invest in our society, make those investments. And with the kind of educational investments you want are not just college. We want to see career-oriented investments so that we have apprenticeship programs that are funded. We want to see that the two-thirds of our students that don't go to college have a way of making a good living and contributing to our economy. We want to see health care and child care invested so that families can, can, be, uh, can make sure that their families are well taken care of. If there's nutrition assistance needed, we need to, we need to make sure that's available. Those kinds of things are funded by tax dollars, and we need more tax dollars. We vote for those programs. We have a deficit because we vote for those, some of those programs, and we don't fund them. We should be voting for more of them, and we should be paying for them. And those are the exact programs that the GOP just tried to uh, eliminate and reduce with their uh, debt limit uh, blackmail. So we want to make sure the minimum wage is strong. Many states are stepping up and fixing it, but the federal government is not. We need the federal minimum wage to be indexed to inflation so that as our, our inflation grows and as our economy grows, the minimum wage keeps up with that. We want to strengthen workers' rights to make sure that they have the right to form a union, they have support in forming a union, and that they have the right to earn overtime if they work hard, they have the, the right to uh, earning benefits, if that's what your company provides, uh, we we need to in to help workers' rights that have been uh, beaten down by folks on the right with a lot of money. We want to make sure our social safety nets stay strong. We want to make sure that uh, our education uh, is is available, and we stop wasting uh, uh, human capital. We want to invest in vocational training, career development. We want to make sure that we have some upwards mobility with our with our our lower middle class and poor, and we have to make sure that we stop this this looking down on some parts of our population. You know, for forever, about eleven percent of our population has been gay, and some small percent are trans. Those are citizens uh, worthy of equal rights and equal opportunities for all of us. Uh, we shouldn't have a pay gap between male and female. We certainly shouldn't have any discrimination against a gay or trans anywhere in our society. And I know there's some fine points, uh, athletic competition, for example, and we can figure those out. But in, in, in general, we have to, to ensure that we continue to have equality. And none of this happens except through politics. At the bottom line, this presentation is not about economics. It's about politics. We let them do this to us because we let them get these things from our government. And we have to take our government back and get what we need from our government. We can do it at the state level. It's easier to do it at the state level. And when you do it in state after state after state, that becomes easier at the federal level. An example is the, the assault weapons ban. We just passed one. Washington State just passed one. That's 11 states. That's 20% of the country that's covered by assault weapons ban. If state after state keeps doing that, it's going to be easier to make the federal government do it. Many changes through uh, 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 racial, racial marriage, other marriage equality, um, uh, drug laws, many laws emanate from state activity. So we're here, we can get to Springfield, we can push on our legislators, and then we can push on our federal legislators too. Um, Durbin, Durbin is the chairman of the, uh, the, the Judicial Committee. He could do something about this, the Supreme Court. He could do something about, about how we elect judges. We need to push on a guys like Durbin that have power that we, we can express our power through them. So this is all about politics. And your call to action is to get involved, to contribute if you can. But we know we can't beat them with money. We know we're going to beat them on the ground. We beat them in the local school board, boards here. We beat them with the assault weapons ban. We beat them in the midterm elections. We tried to beat them with the fair tax amendment, and we didn't get that one done. So we're going to have to do that again. But this is how we do it. 
we do it by being motivated and by by part, working with your political groups, working with your progressive groups, knocking on doors, postcards, letters, phone calls. Uh, that's how we can do it. We know what we have to do. You know what you have to do. Help us do it. I'm done. I'm ready for questions. <laughs>